We have the we have the privilege this morning of looking at the first of the two great and exalted visions of Jesus Christ in the Revelation, Revelation chapter one verses nine to twenty. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to see the truth in your word. We know that's a God thing, that is your, your, your work in us. As we apply ourselves to studying and understanding, you open our eyes to see and um, help us understand and comprehend. So we ask for you to do that. We ask that uh, would be true in all of our work as we're reading and studying uh, this wonderful book during the week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Of course, we're going to see John's exalted vision of Jesus Christ this morning. And um, I just want to point out that this vision was needed. The situation of the church in 96 AD, which is the time that is concluded in that range that Jesus wrote, that John wrote this book, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Christians were hated uh, and despised in the Roman Empire. Uh, for example, Pliny wrote that they followed a depraved and extravagant superstition. Tacitus wrote that people in the church were a class hated for their abominations. Suetonius said that they were a set of men adhering to a novel and mischievous superstition. Politically, they were viewed as being disloyal to Caesar, and they had been accused of harboring anti-government plots. Thirty years before, they had been falsely blamed for the burning of Rome in 64 AD, and the animus created from that false accusation still lingered for the church, even after 30 years. Religiously, they were considered worshipers of a, an illegal religion. They were denounced as atheists because they did not believe in the, Roman, the pantheon of Roman gods, nor worship them. They did not also engage in imperial worship, worshiping the, the current Caesar, who would proclaim himself as God. They refused to do both of those things, so they were denounced as atheists, and they were rumored to be, because of the very things that we've done here today in breaking bread, they were rumored to be cannibals, incestuous, and sexually perverted. Socially, they were hated uh, for their threat to the hierarchical society, because to Christians, both the upper class and the lower classes were the same. There was no distinction between them. And they refused to join in with pagan society and the entertainments. Economically, they were seen as a threat by those who crafted and sold idols. And it was very difficult for a Christian to get a job. Under Domitian, in 90 AD, an official persecution of the church had started. It was now a government policy to persecute the church, to squash out Christianity. As a result, John had been exiled to the island called Patmos, and all of the other apostles had been martyred by this time. John was the only one of them that was alive. I think you can conclude with me that the church was definitely in need of encouragement. Only 60 years earlier, Jesus had raised from the dead and then ascended into heaven, into the clouds. But by this time, all the original glory had long since worn off. And the going was very tough. They needed a fresh view of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were about to get it. And we're going to eavesdrop on what they got to see through John's writing. The setting of the vision, 
goes from verses 9 to 11. I'll read. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Christ Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. You see that John here identifies himself in simple terms. He calls himself a brother, your, fe- your brother. He calls himself a fellow partaker. He didn't identify himself as an apostle, as an elder. He didn't identify himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved. He just used these simple identifiers. Your brother and a fellow partaker. He was saying, I'm just an observer of what has happened here, and I'm writing it down for you. I'm recording what I've seen and what I've heard. He was a fellow partaker in tribulation, in the kingdom, and in the perseverance, which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus said in John 16, 33, that in this world you will have tribulation. But take courage, he said, I've overcome the world. So until Jesus comes, the church is going to have tribulation. We have been in a bubble. We've been in a bubble of protection, and I don't know that it's a blessed state. It just is in this experiment called the United States. We've been in a bubble of protection and freedom. That's not the case with the church around the world. We've spoken of the church in India. We, we could, anywhere you look, the church in Turkey, in these seven cities that are going to be addressed in chapters two and three. There are some Christians, but mainly not. The Turks are Muslim. And it's hard for them to live. Afghanistan, you could just name places all around the world. And that's the normal situation, tribulation. He was a fellow partaker in the kingdom. We're currently participants in God's kingdom that will come in power and great glory in the millennium and in, eternal, in eternity, but we're currently participating in the kingdom of God right now by three means. Number one, we anticipate it coming in power and great glory. Number two, uh, we are currently identified as kings and priests, and we're servants in the kingdom. Third, we get some of the kingdom benefits <clears throat> thrust into our present lives from the instead of them being reserved for the future, we get to enjoy them right now because we have the Holy Spirit who is living among us, and the Holy Spirit is called an earnest or a down payment of what we're going to see in the kingdom. So we are participants in the kingdom. Um, one writer put it this way, the kingdom of God in the eschatological future will be realized in the entire cosmos. In fact, the cosmos will be destroyed and then recreated. And the kingdom of God will occupy the entire cosmos. Uh, now, though, the reality of the... Uh, it is now present in the reality of the Christian community. Present on earth in the midst of the worldly demonic powers. So we are the embodiment. The kingdom is present in us. That's one aspect of it. John was exiled due to preaching the gospel. He says that here. I was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And I want you to take note of this. Note the equivalence that John gives to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. They're equivalent. John uses them synonymously. So what God says and what Jesus said says they're equal, they're equivalent. Beloved, Jesus is God. We see that so many times in chapter 1 at the end. I'm going to have a slide which summarizes the things we've seen about the deity of Christ in this chapter.
John continues, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Think about the sound of a trumpet. Clear, penetrating, loud. And John heard a voice and he said, it's like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. Then he lists the seven churches. And you're familiar with the seven churches by now. You know that um, the seven churches are located in Asia Minor, which is on the western end of the body of land that is current modern-day Turkey. And in that province, you see Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, the ruins of all those cities exist today. And there are cities that are built on and around them. And you can go. You can go visit them. The Turks don't mind having you as a tourist. And you can go. You can get in a tour. You can go from each of these cities. You can see all the awesome ruins. There's some, in some cases, really wonderful ruins. In other cases, there's not so much left, just a pile of rocks. Um, but, but you can be in those places if that's something that you desire. They exist. They're real cities. That's my point. They're real cities. And um, Jesus said to John, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. And then he listed their names. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So, so John's there. He's in the spirit in the Lord's day. Let me just have a time of meditation and worship. He's a, and he's in the spirit in the Lord's day. And he hears this voice behind him, like the sound of a trumpet. And it says these things. And then he wrote, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And having turned, he saw a vision of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to unfold that vision. It occurs in verses 12 to 16 and in verse 20. Well, we'll read that now because that is related to um, our understanding of the vision. I'll read it. I saw seven golden lampstands. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like, the, like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused, made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars and, on his, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face, his face, his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, Jesus is telling him now, and the seven golden lampstands, let me tell you what they are. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is not Jesus meek and mild, born in a stable to peasant parents, raised in a carpenter's house. This is not Jesus on a cross in his humility. But this is Jesus Christ, exalted, glorified, judging, ruling, and controlling, and administering to his church. Your Lord, your King, your commander is not a silent, retiring storyteller with children in his lap. He did do that, yes. That, that, that is one image of him. That's him in his humiliation, in his humility. This is not Jesus in his humility. This is Jesus in his glory. He is exalted. 
He is authoritative and he is glorious. Now, don't get hung up with the artwork. I mean, if you don't like it, then don't like it, okay? Uh, this, is, this is a vision. <laughs> These are symbols. But this is the image that was constructed in Pat Marvanko Smith's mind as an artist, and she put it down. I, I like it. I like many, many features of it. But don't get hung up on that. Uh, the symbols uh, that are represented here are going to be, to a large part, explained in the current context, and some you have to go outside to further context to get an understanding of what the symbols are. But let's just work our way through the passage. John said, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man. The lampstands represent the churches. We learned that in verse 20. The lampstands are the churches. It says that. Beloved, local churches are designed to embody and give out the light of God. That, that's how we're pictured before God. And this title, Son of Man, one like the Son of Man, is a messianic title. It was used first in Daniel. And Jesus used this name for himself more than any other name. And it harkens back to the book of Daniel. And when he was saying the Son of Man does this and this, he's, he's identifying with the person who is identified as the Messiah and who is called the Son of Man in Daniel. What we see here is the living, exalted Christ ministering to and empowering his church. He's standing in the middle of his churches. Now, as I said before, the symbolic pictures or features um, will be explained, and all of those features are used in his addresses that he gives in chapters 2 and 3 to the seven churches. They all come up. So, let's look at them. One like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. The robe and the sash are priests or king's garments. And Jesus intercedes for his church as its great high priest, and Jesus is the king. He has authority and he rules in his church. Verse 14, his head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. He had blazing white hair. And this blazing white head and hair refer to the deity and the judgment that he came to do of Christ. For example, just to show you an example of this, in Daniel chapter 9, 7, verses 9 and 10, we see these fragments of, of words. I just pulled out the ones that, that are important to us. There Daniel said, I saw the Ancient of Days. Well, that's a reference to God, right? He took his seat... What did he look like? The hair of his head, like pure wool. This is a description for God, the Ancient of Days. The court sat and the books were opened. So here is, in this blazing imagery, God in judgment, evaluating and judging. Verse 14b, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. Flaming eyes, again, speak of the righteous penetrating judgment that Jesus is going to execute. In Hebrews 4.13, it says, there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And we saw in the first hour that includes your thoughts, your thinking. He knows your motives. He knows why you really did something. Uh, when your wife says, that is not what you said. Well, Jesus knows what you said. Well, that's what, that's what I meant. And Jesus knows what you meant. He, know, he knows all the motives. He knows everything about you. That, that's a, pictured here in the flaming eyes of judgment. Verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in a furnace. 
Glowing bronze, again, speaks of judgment. I say that because what was the, te- what was the altar at the temple made of? The, the sacrificial altar on the outside of the temple where people came to... What was it made of? It was bronze. The brazen altar, it's called. It was bronze. The person would come, they'd put their hand on the horn of the altar, they'd confess their sins, the animal would be burnt up, and the fragrant aroma would go up to God, and sacrifice would be made. It's a, this is... The context is uh, of that glowing bronze, what what that's referring to, that's judgment. And we see that in the temple. So if you put it all together, this is adding up here, don't you think? The the white head, the hair, I don't know if he had an afro like this, but his his hair was white. The glowing bronze feet All of these things speak of judgment. So when Christ is seen in power and great glory, he is seen in the position of being a judge. He comes in the posture of being a judge. Judgment is first to begin with the household of God. Judgment in the church. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us, First, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Yes, the gospel is something to be obeyed. Believe, Jesus said. That is imperative. Believe. If you don't believe, you disobey. You don't disobey me. You disobey him. This him. And judgment is to begin here with the church of God. And we see that in chapter 2 and chapter 3. God's going to look at those seven churches and those seven towns. Those seven towns are seven postal districts. Good place to send a letter and let it be distributed around. And And he's going to judge and he's going to evaluate. And hopefully as we listen to it, we're going to take it to heart. So his judgment begins with the church, but secondly, 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 judgment of the unrepentant world. And we're going to see that in chapter 6 through chapter 19. Jesus takes the book. Jesus opens the seven seals. And out of those seven seals come judgment on a wicked and unrepentant world. The seventh seal contains the seven trumpets, which is more judgment on an unrepentant world. And the seventh trumpet contains the seven bowls of the wrath of God, which is the last, because in these bowls the wrath of God is finished. You see, Jesus is here, poised and prepared for judgment. And his voice, his voice was like the sound of many waters. It was like the sound of a trumpet, it's like the sound of many waters. Many waters, just like, just like all the streams flow together and they go into the river and the river becomes a torrent and then it comes over some rough land and it's just roaring like the sound of many waters. This is a voice of authority a voice of finality in speaking. Just like all those streams go together into the river, so all the streams of Old Testament prophecy come together and they converge in what he has to say. They all flow together and culminate in Jesus' authoritative voice. This is Christ speaking with authority and power in his church and in the world. You know, beloved, it just, boom, it just hit me in the head. I don't, I don't like our political candidates. I mean, they just make me tired. I'm just so sad. I'm just so sad. Somebody who has a fragment of good message and has to just be like a, a fool. Then somebody who has a message I don't so much support and it's just like, okay. 
I, I just heard, I just heard a, um, an advertisement on TV. One, a doctor is standing there and she's saying, I just don't like what Yvette Harrell wants to do to women. I took an oath to protect people. And my response back is, well, what about the babies? Who's protecting the babies? So I, I'm not liking our political slate, okay? But they're not the ones in the prime position of authority. My Savior, the Lord, He's the one who is the judge. He's the one. And we see Him right here. If you can have that picture in your mind, when you have to go about your duty as a citizen and you have to make a choice, and you, and you should. Well, I don't like the choice. Well, choose. Sorry. Choose. Choose the one that's most consistent with what you want to see. But I don't like to do that. Just know. Just know. That person's not in ultimate authority. This is the person in ultimate authority. And if you can have that mindset, this will change your life. It'll change the, your anxiety level. It'll change you getting all stirred up. He's in control. He is in control. The people in human government serve at his will. He puts them in and he takes them out. He puts them in and he takes them out. And they're serving a purpose. So don't just fight against him. Just relax. He's in charge. Okay, let's go on. Was that in my notes? No. Okay, the seven star. Okay, Jesus is the one with the last word. And we see that in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, after he spoke long ago in many, uh, to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days has spoken to us in his son. The word his is actually not there. He's spoken to us in son like a language. Jesus is the language. He held seven stars in his right hand. Verse 20 says that these seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Do you ever wonder what that means? Is that a little puzzle to you? <laughs> of course it is. The word angel is the trend. Excuse me? I am, I am, I am in this sense, actually. Okay, let me, yes, yeah. But I'll get there, Daryl. Angel is a translation of the Greek word angelos, and it can be translated as angel, as an angelic being. It can also be translated as messenger, one sent to proclaim. Many times in Scripture, it's used to refer to an angelic being. It's also translated as messenger. An example of that, Luke chapter 7, verse 24. It says, when the messengers of John, that's angelos, is the root there, when the messengers of John had left, some messengers from John the Baptist had come and spoken to Jesus. And when those messengers left, then Jesus spoke to the crowds about John the Baptist. So the word angelos can be translated as messenger. They are mentioned, the angels of the seven churches. Each of them is mentioned in chapters 2 and 3. They are the actual addressees to which the letters go. To the angel at the church at Ephesus, write. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write. I believe, it's my opinion, is my conclusion is that this is a reference most likely to a leading or a representative elder of that church. We know how there are leaders among leaders. And the group of men who were charged with and took to heart the care of the church. One of them was the addressee for each of the churches. Now, 
there's, an, there's another reason why I think that the translation messenger is better and it's a reference to a human being is better than a reference to an angelic being is because angelic beings are never corrected, chastised, or warned, right? They're binary beings. Either they are holy angels and they follow God and they obey him, or they disobey and boom, they are demons. They're fallen angels. They, they don't get chastised. They don't get corrected. The word of God is, like, is for us is, uh, I mean, it shows us the truth. It shows us where we've deviated from the truth. It shows us how to get back on the truth. And it shows us how to live in the truth. The angels don't have that opportunity. They're either holy angels or they're demons. And in the seven letters, each of the letters is addressed to the angel of the church and correction is given and their sins are identified. Well, it doesn't make sense for that to be a an angelic being, it makes more sense to me that it would be a human being. So, having made that determination, look what we have. Jesus, holding the leadership of his church in his hand. You see, he's in control. He's in control, he's in control whether those of us who are leaders in the church know it or not. He's still in control. He holds those leaders in his hands. I think that's a wonderful picture. Out of his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword. The sharp sword is the word of God. Christ's word. We saw earlier in verse 9 that these are synonymous. John was on the island of Patmos, Patmos because of the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. Synonymous. And, and so they're, they're, they're equivalent. And here, the sharp sword is the word of God. It's Christ's word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's the imagery that's given. And it's piercing as far as the division between the soul and the spirit. think of a sword. The sword is used for a couple of things. I, I, it's used for protection if you're on this side of the sword. <laughs> it's used for protection. Uh, God, the Lord Jesus protects his church with his, with his word. And secondly, he is going to defeat his enemies with his word. When in chapter 19, Christ returns on a white horse with a robe dipped in blood, he has the same sword. And it's the only weapon in the army because the armies of God are following him on white horses and they have no weapons. No weapons are mentioned. The only mention of a weapon is the sword that's in his hand. So he comes and the only sword that's there and the only weapon that is, is present is wielded by him. And when he comes and all the people are gathered there to make war against him, he slays them with the sword, with the word of his mouth. He speaks and it's done. They lose. To die. We see that in Revelation 19.21. And the rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. Now this is an, an opportunity to just point out what we mean by taking the revelation uh, and using it literally and grammatically and a historical kind of trans, uh, uh, understanding of it and we literally understand this to be a figure of speech. We literally understand this to be an image or a vision. It literally is a picture. <laughs> We're not saying that Jesus, you know, has a sword coming out of his mouth in the sense that he goes and around and kills all the people. No, 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 it's, a, it's an image, it's a vision. And his face, his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. Psalm 84, 11 says that the Lord God is the sun. 
Matthew 17, 2 says that Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, and his face shone like the sun. And his garments became white as light. This is the glory of God. Shining like a sun, glorious. And Jesus had this. John turned around and he saw him. And he saw this image, and it's taken us, you know, 20 minutes to go through the explanation, but that's not the way John's processing it. No, he turned around, and it's like, whoa. We're going to find out later he fell down. But, but he, he, he just processing all this. He sees the glory of God shining in its strength. Here's the thing. God's glory is reflected through us. Second Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, true believers, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord to Spirit. This is absolutely stunning. When we look into God's word, we see Jesus in his glory. And as we look at it, as we study it and contemplate it and believe it and apply it and obey it, as we eat it and it nourishes our soul, so to speak, we are changed into the very image that we are looking at step by step from glory to glory by the working of God, the Holy Spirit. So Christ's glory shining in this vision is the same glory that is reflected to the world through you and me. Talk about a high calling. Talk about a high position. You carry that glory with you whenever you say, I am a Christian. How do you live? Do you live in a consistent manner to what you say? You are a light to the world. There are other scriptures that speak and use the same sort of metaphorical language to describe what's happening. Well, I love that. All right, that's the vision. That brings us to the effects of the vision. The effects on John. The first effect was fear. <laughs> he's sitting there. He's in the spirit on the Lord's day by himself because that's the only person he can be with because he's in exile. He's on his own. And he hears a voice behind him like the sound of a trumpet, penetrating, loud, clear. Gives him instructions, write this stuff down, and he turns and he sees. And he processes it all. Verse 17a says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. That's the appropriate response when you see God. Ezekiel, for example, saw God, it's recorded at least three times. And every time Ezekiel saw him, Ezekiel 128 says, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. Then in verse chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, the glory of the Lord was standing there like the glory which I saw by the river Chibar. That's the reference to the vision in chapter 1 that we just looked at. When I saw the Lord standing there, the glory of the Lord standing there, I fell on my face. Then again in chapter 43, he saw God and he fell on his face. Compare that to the casual, the casual descriptions of people seeing God today. Uh uh. Uh uh. Remember what C.S. Lewis wrote about Aslan in his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? 
Aslan, the lion, was a picture, was a representative of Jesus, of Christ. And he said, he's not a tame lion. He's not a tame lion. When John saw him, he fell on his face. That's the first effect of the vision. Then, immediately after that, the second effect of the vision was assurance. I love this. He placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. The risen, exalted Christ is the living one. We need not fear what's going to happen in life. He is the alive forevermore. We need not fear death. And he has the keys for death and Hades. Hades is just the place of disembodied spirits. It's the place where it was thought that people go, whether righteous or unrighteous. I have the key. He says, I have the keys of death and Hades. We need not fear eternity. I mean, if this one we're seeing is our friend. I mean, if we have chosen to be on his side, then he is not our enemy. The third response was duty. Duty. Jesus said to him, write what you've seen. With privilege comes duty. John's duty was to write. Our duty is to believe in him, to follow him, to know him, to love him, to obey him. in all of our lives, in every aspect of our lives, in, with all of our heart. That's our duty. Isn't, isn't this awesome? I mean, it's just absolutely stunning. This will change your world. If you can actually see it, if you can actually realize what is represented here in this picture that John saw and is given to us as a vision... If we can realize what it's saying is that Jesus is resurrected, he is alive, and he is ruling. He's the judge. He's the judge of the church. He's the judge of the world. He's going to judge the world. If you get that in your head, what a change it'll make in the way we think and even in the way we act. Now, just as a summary, this is like a bonus chart. Um, I couldn't help but write down... uh, the references to the deity of Christ in this chapter. Uh, We've already seen the equivalence of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus in verses 2 and 9, and that equates Jesus with God. Then chapter 1, verse 8, identifies the Lord, God. Okay, this is a logic thing. You have to follow me here. Chapter chapter 1, verse 8, identifies the Lord God, the Almighty, as the Alpha and the Omega. I want you to compare that to what Jesus says in chapter 22, verses 12 and 13. Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he's done. Jesus is the judge. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Someone has already claimed that position. How many alphas and omegas can there be? Well, just one in the same sense. In the same sense, there can only be one. The Lord God, the Almighty, is the Alpha and the Omega. The coming one, the Christ, the Son of God, is the Alpha and the Omega. Therefore, Jesus is God. And this lowercase alpha and lowercase omega and uppercase, that's just me. I just didn't, I wasn't consistent, okay? Don't get hung up on that. 
Okay, then, that, that's one. That's two. The word is, of God is the word of Jesus. That's one. Two is they're both the Alpha and the Omega. Then in verse 17, also in chapter 2, verse 8, and in chapter 22, verse 13, Jesus identifies himself as the first and the last. <laughs> Those are pretty absolute terms. In Isaiah 41, 44, and 48, God calls himself the first and the last. For example, Isaiah 44, 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. There is no God besides me. If Jesus is the first and the last, then God, the Father is the first and the last, then they're both God. Then in verse 17 also, Jesus calls himself the living one. I am the living one. I was dead, now I'm alive. I am the living one. I'm alive forevermore. Fifteen times in the Old Testament, God is called the living one. Thirteen times in the New Testament, God is called the living God. Jesus said, I'm the living one. Jesus is God. Now, the way this is, the way this is, you could formulate this. I'll, I'll show you this in just a moment. But first I want to show you this book. This is uh, by Edward Henry Bickersteth. He's a bishop in England, died around 1900 and one. This is the best book I've ever read on the Trinity. It might not be the best book for you. I'm an engineer. I like things to be presented sequentially. I can connect dot A to dot B. And to read this book, you don't go sit and read this book for entertainment. This is not a casually read book. You have to work at this book. But it is the best book I've ever read on the Trinity. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you how I used it. We had one a person here at the church. Uh, he was the basketball coach for the women's team at New Mexico State. He and his wife came here and their young boy. And she was getting assailed and assaulted by Jehovah's Witnesses. And she was being drawn in that direction. And she was beginning to question her faith. And he came to me and said, would you please help my wife? So we went through some of the things in this book. She saw it clearly and she said, forget you, we're not meeting again ever. I got a big hug from Coach Sutherland. That was kind of cool. So I'm telling you, this is a great book. And uh, it's old. It was printed in 1957. Uh, you can only buy it online as a used book. But I commend it to you because he's the one who formulated for me the first time this sentence. If there is one God, and we know there is one God, Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. There's one God. If there is one God, and if there are three persons who are identified as God, and here we've seen two of them, the Father and the Son, then those three persons are the one God. And he goes through and shows hundreds of ways how both the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are identified in the same way. They're called the same things. They do the same things. They're attributed the same uh, characteristic. It's awesome. It's an awesome book. I'll just lay it on the table here. You take a picture of it. And there's, I think I saw like maybe four or five more available from different vendors that are used. It costs like $5.99 or something like that. Okay, well, let's pray. Lord, I, I ask that you would uh, help us as we consider your word and you'd make it alive and active to us and in our hearts and that we would see who you are and we would grow in our understanding of you. And uh, we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. 
Okay, we have a few minutes before the kids get out. If you have a question, you know the drill. Then come, come to the table and pick up the microphone and turn it on. If you don't have a question, that is totally fine with me. I'm tired, Daryl. You're tired? I'm tired, Daryl. You're younger than me. By a few months. By a year and a few months. Well, when's your birthday? September? Yeah, by a year and two days, I'm younger than you. That's like nothing when you consider eternity. Okay, does anybody have a question? Okay, good, we're dismissed.